Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Sandler. I am the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, I'm a lawyer, uh, but I usually only give legal advice for free, mostly to charity. Um, and I am super into free and open source software. Um, and I've been thinking about the role of free and open source software uh, for a while. And it's been a very interesting year, which has caused me to do a lot of self-reflection about um, the role of free and open source software in society. And uh, I'm going to take you through sort of my, uh, my journey over the last year. These are my Twitter handles. So if you are looking at your phone or other device, I know it's because you're tweeting. So keep it up. Thank you. I know you're going to say this talk was so awesome. Um, so, uh, so I feel like you need to know a little bit more about me before uh, you can get where I'm coming from in my analysis about uh, open source and free software. This is a picture of where I went to university. It's called the Cooper Union. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Cooper Union. Nobody. Oh, one person. Two people. Great. Um, it, uh, the Cooper Union is a university in the United States. It's a tiny school. It's about 1,000 people, including grad students. Um, and it was founded on the principle that education should be free, which in the United States was a really revolutionary <laughs> concept. So for a long time, the Cooper Union was the only free university in the United States. Um, and it only had degrees in art, architecture, and engineering. Um, and I went there for engineering. I effectively split uh, electrical and mechanical engineering. Um, but the most, uh, uh, there were quite a lot of formative things about going there. One was that uh, in a, in a, growing up in a country where, um, where going to university had a lot of the trappings of being very wealthy, the fact that there was a school where it was full scholarship for anyone who got in was a completely different model and uh, pretty cool. Um, and I showed up on my first day and sat in my C and Fortran class. Up until that time, I had only programmed in BASIC. Um, and I show up uh, to my C and Fortran class, and they say, you know, because I'm old, they say, you got to go to the computer center to get your account because nobody had their own computer. And so I go into the computer center to get the account, and there were no women in the computer center. It was full. But there were no women, and I went with a friend who I had just made in the class, and we looked around, and it was really weird because uh, 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 it was a, a, a very um, uncomfortable culture for us. Uh, there was even a guy who had ASCII porn on his screen, uh, which was very innovative at the time. So, <laughs> but, uh, but she just left, my friend, and she said, I'll just come back later. Right? And I was, I, I, at the time, sort of thought, well, this is such old news that there would be any kind of sexism in a technical environment. Please, we're so beyond that now. So I went and marched into the head of the computer center's office, and I said, you got to do something about the situation here, because there are no women hanging out, and it feels weird. And he said, what's your name? And I told him, and he said, you're hired. And I said, <laughs> what do you mean? And uh, so what they did is they had, uh, they had this uh, people called computer center operators who wore white lab coats and walked around the room and helped people with their work. Um, and so I became one of those people, and he ha tapped the, the, most, you know, the, the, uh, the most advanced people in the computer center to help me. And he said, get her root as soon as possible. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and so that was sort of like a, a crash course for me. And that was my first introduction to free and open source software. I mean, instead of, in addition to using some of the stuff that, you know, GCC, like a lot of the software that you would have used anyway, um, in that academic program, we installed a, a GNU Linux lab. And I remember thinking, boy, this free software idea, this Linux thing is pretty cool. It's too bad it won't last. And so I went off and went to law school and didn't really think about much about, uh, about technology and ethics again. I didn't think about free and open source software for sure. These are pictures that I actually took from my, uh, my law office in New York. So these are views from my desk of my, um, my, my paperwork and uh, text. Uh, it's a deal book. Um, and 
my um, my suit jacket and the view from my office, which is of the Chrysler Building, which was sweet. Um, and I totally immersed myself entirely in financial law, in like uh, debt and like doing uh, uh, bonds, and um, and I even did some uh, some IPO work. Um, and I, uh, I just, I did that for a while, and it was, um, it was really interesting. But I was so far away from technology, and uh, and then I started getting involved, and it's a much longer story. Oh no! I just got an error message. Leave our office. I love you, but you crashed during my presentation. <laughs> but as a former executive director of the Gnome Foundation. Um, it may, it, it's tough to know what the... Um, this is very exciting. Okay, here we go. Okay, phew. Sorry if that happens again. Uh, I, when I was executive director of the GNOME Foundation, this was always my uh, my biggest nightmare was that GNOME was going to was going to have some issue during a presentation, um, and I was always super smug when all the people using um, you know Windows and um, and Apple like MacBooks and um, and Apple products would present and they would have problems, and I would say that proprietary software it's just so unreliable. <laughs> So luckily, this n didn't happen <laughs> then. Um, so, uh, so I, for a long story uh, short, I wound up uh, doing pro bono legal work for um, doing legal work for a free and open source software project, and using that corporate financial background in order to help them um, with their um, help them with uh, with their challenges. Um, Pl the Plone Foundation, for example, um, was one of my first clients, and I helped them get their tax exemption status in the United States. And part of that was describing why free and open source software should be charitable, because we had to, the, the German charitable system is quite similar. I've been uh, through it with uh, uh, some of the, uh, the German organizations. I'm not as a, a lawyer since I'm only admitted in the United States, but um, as just a, a general participant. And you explain why it should be treated uh, charitably. And so I was doing that for, for free and open source software projects. I, I, was, I thought that open source was cool. I thought that, um, that it was really useful. And I had kind of a culture clash when I came in, coming from the securities law world, wondering, sort of like, are these people for real? My clients were passionate about software freedom. They were passionate about free and open source software and explaining why it should be charitable, you know, why it should be treated like, um, you know, like, the, like an organization that, um, that uh, helps people recover from disasters or uh, helps children, that uh, helps people that are destitute. And, and I sort of, it took me a little while to sort of figure out, like, you know, how to explain that and how to believe it. And what was interesting is that my, the clients who I was representing were just so passionate. And I didn't, you know, and it was interesting also because some of my clients were, really copy left people and like, you know, like the Free Software Foundation and um, people who are really uh, GPL, um, uh, pro GPL. And then some of my clients were like the BSDs who were ideologically opposed to copy left and thought that it was a different idea of freedom. And over time, I sort of, um, I, I came on board. You know, I, I, they convinced me through their work that what they were doing was important, and I started to see the broader societal impacts of it. But still, I really just was someone who thought that open source was cool. I thought it was useful, um, but I was on the fence, really, about whether or not, um, you know, how fundamental this issue was. Was it, you know, is, was all this talk about freedom like an overstatement? Right? People who are worrying about software freedom are often people who aren't worrying about where their next meal is coming from. And so, you know, where, where is the perspective and where is the line? And, uh, and then um, I discovered that I had a medical condition. So I literally have a big heart. <laughs> um, my heart is the three times the size of a normal person's heart. Um, and I'm asymptomatic 
but, uh, or mostly asymptomatic, uh, but I am at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Um, the doctors actually call it sudden death, is the technical medical phrase, which is really weird. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the doctor, the cardiologist, sort of told me, you know, you're, you're fine as long as, you know, you're at a high risk of sudden di suddenly dying. It's 2 to 3% per year compounding. And I was uh, 31 when I found out that I had the, um, the condition. So the chances of dying in the next decade were extremely high. And they said that, um, that it was OK, because all I would need to do was to get this defibrillator um, implanted in my body. And if I got that, then if I went into sudden death, uh, the device would be there, and it would shock me, and everything would be OK. Um, and when you go to the electrophysiologist's office for something like this, they keep sample devices in their desks. So uh, they're extremely expensive devices. I know because in the United States, of course, our health insurance, our health care system is really crazy. And so uh, you get a bill uh, for, for everything. Even if you have good insurance, you get the bill, a report for what your insurance is covered. And my defibrillator was so expensive. They're actually, I think, are a little cheaper in Europe. Um, but uh, uh, because it's what the, you know, it's market driven. Um, but so in the electrophysiologist's office, they have the little devices and they have them in their desk drawers. And so when you need one, what they do is they let you hold them. There's like, they, they, the guy, the electrophysiologist slipped my device across the desk and he was sort of looking at me expectantly. My mother was there, you know, uh, for support. And they both like kind of look at me as I hold this little device. And he's looking at me like, see, it's not so scary. It's a small device. And, um, and I look at him and I say, what does it run? <laughs> and he said, run. And I said, yeah, run. My, this device has software on it. Software is vulnerable. This is very close to what I do. I spent a lot of time thinking about the ethics of software. And can you tell me anything about it? And he said, software? The guy implanted sometimes multiple devices in a day, thousands of devices. And it had never occurred to him that there was software on these devices that he was putting in people's bodies. And he said, but he was, he was a good guy. He said. No worries. Don't worry about this because you're in luck. Today in the, um, in the office right now is the representative of Medtronic. And so he'll know everything that you need to know. And so, uh, and so he calls in Tom and Tom comes in and he looks at Tom and he says, this woman has asked really interesting questions about the defibrillator. She's asking, what does it run? And Tom says, run? And I say, yeah, there's software on the device, yada, yada. He says, software? And then he said, don't worry about it, because you can call the, this hotline, this technical hotline, and they'll tell you everything you need to know. So I called the hotline, and I was put in a phone tree abyss. And uh, I, uh, I eventually uh, realized that, um, uh, that I was going to need to get the device, and I couldn't put it off. So I got the device, but I launched a research project uh, oh, so I got the device. I forgot this, uh, this fun slide of how I became a cyborg with uh, proprietary software literally sewn into my body and screwed into my heart. And uh, 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 suddenly, the issues that I was researching and thinking about in the context of free and open source software and charitable activities became significantly less abstract and much more real. Suddenly, my life relied on this, and it seemed really important. Um, and like once I got over the whole idea of becoming a cyborg and having um, you know medical implants and things like that, um, I started to embrace the fact that I was unique and that I would have a really different perspective on these issues. So I launched a, um, a research program into the safety and efficacy of these devices. And what I found will not surprise most of you in the room, which is that the devices are totally vulnerable. Um, there's uh, most of, almost all of them are broadcasting um, wirelessly via radio telemetry, and there's no real security on them at all. We have the worst of both worlds. We have closed and proprietary software that can't be reviewed um, when we know that free and open source software is safer over time. Um, not all free software is better or safer, but it, it stands a chance we can fix problems when they happen, um, et cetera. So uh, uh, 
launching this, this program, I also did research into the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, and most of the other countries that I researched are the same, where, um, where the, the agency that's approving these devices is also not reviewing the software. So not only is the software um, vulnerable to attack and has been shown to be exploitable in the cases of many medical implanted medical devices, but because we're not, the, our governmental agencies are not even asking for copies of the source code, there's no public repository, there's, uh, there's no recourse in the instance that, um, that my device starts to fail or has a, a, a really fundamental problem. If there's catastrophic failure at Medtronic, um, or at any of the other medical, major medical devices, all of the patients who have those devices have to get them removed, basically. Um, so uh, if, med if the device manufacturer is not so inclined to fix it. Um, so that's sort of how I became passionate about free and open source software the first time. And I became really involved because when it's your life, it suddenly becomes a much bigger deal. It, the issues became stark reality for me. It, uh, it was. It was so clear that, uh, that, that this was a, a problem that, uh, that needed to be addressed. And, um, and while it's quite dramatic to talk about my heart condition in this way, it's a metaphor for all of the software we rely on, right? While we have an internet of things where all of our software is talking to everything else, we're only as safe as our weakest link. When researchers want to show that cars are vulnerable to attack, they don't go right to the ignition system or the brake system. They usually get in through the entertainment system or the wheel maintenance system. So all of our software that we are, all of our critical software that we rely on for our lives and our society need to be um, free and open source software. We need to know that if, if there is a big fundamental problem that we can fix it. But, um, but we don't even know which of our software is going to be life and society critical. So it's very difficult to know where to draw the line. Um, and so uh, I co-founded the Software Freedom Conservancy. We're an umbrella organization to help prepare, uh, to help um, free software projects that are alternatives to proprietary software to succeed. Um, this is a list of all of our, um, uh, not, uh, it's, it's a, a recent list of our, our member projects, but we've added Core Boot uh, since then in uh, the closure community. Um, but, uh, but as you can see, we have uh, uh, Git and Samba Linescape. We've got over 40 projects, um, and uh, including uh, Outreachy, which is a diversity program for women and people of color um, who are underrepresented in tech in the U.S., um, although the rest of the program is, uh, is global. Um, and, and so I've, I've been plugging away at this for a long time. Um, and, and working on this, we also are known for, um, for being the home of the coalition of, uh, of Linux kernel developers who want to have their, uh, their license enforced on their copyrights. So we funded the lawsuit that Christoph Helwig brought against VMware. Um, some people are nodding. So we're known for defending the GPL. And I've been plugging along like this very righteously, self-righteously, very uh, confident in my choices, very confident in my, um, in my preaching about the importance of free and open source software and how fundamental it is. The, the research all points to free and open source software being better and safer over time. We all know the utility for a commercial enterprise. Um, it was just a matter of getting the word out and being the right kind of evangelistic about it, right? Um, but then, the world sort of started to change in ways that surprised me. I thought I knew what was happening in the world. I thought that I had a good idea of where things were going. Um, I think a lot of people did. Um, but we, uh, I, I realized that I was kind of living in a bubble and that I didn't uh, necessarily see the full red. I, like many others, this is from the, the New York Times, but it's interesting how, um, how comparable a lot of the Brexit and the um, uh, US election uh, themes were kind of similar. Um, so in addition to starting to read Fox News every day, in addition to the New York Times, which I've done since then, <laughs> since leading up to the, the US election, I've just sort of realized that um, that there are uh, that that I needed to revisit a lot of my basic assumptions about what I thought was obviously true and what I thought um, was clearly going to happen, and 
any idea that you're passionate about, anything that you think is so important and so right should be able to survive a really strict criticism and analysis. And so I decided that I had to start from first principles again. And so when I spoke to the uh, Buzzwords organizers about this, um, about this talk, it was, we started, uh, we started talking about speaking on the phone in, I think, even October um, or November before the US election, um, post-Brexit. And, um, and then when we actually spoke on the phone, it was uh, right after the US election. And I was sort of like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about because I don't know if I'm even going to think that free software is so important <laughs> come June because that's a long ways away. And I, I really, you know, a lot of my friends in, uh, who are real free and open source software activists were saying, you know, actually, um, I really I realize that, um, that I only want to work on encryption or I realize that I only want to work on things that relate to the current political climate. Um, and, um, and similarly, a lot of um, donations that people were making to the small free software charities, um, we were all getting emails saying, actually, we're going to donate to the ACLU this year um, instead of your free software charity because we think that the, you know, I, I want my money to have the most impact and I think these issues are really important. And, um, and I thought, you know, fair enough. Like, is, is, is it really so important? Am I spending my time in the right place to be talking about free and open source software? When in order to get to the point to even care about free and open source software, so many things have to go right already. You know, there are so many causes that are so fundamental that need a lot of attention. Should anyone even care at all about free and open source software? And it was the talk, it was talking about what I would say at a conference like this that caused me to go through this really full analysis of whether or not um, what I had previously thought was in fact right. Um, and so I started by coming up with sort of some basic principles um, as to why I cared about free and open source software and what we were doing at Conservancy that I thought was so important that I would ask people to open their wallets to something that they might not um, think was the, the particular cause for them at the time. And, um, and I should hasten to note that, um, that I, I, I didn't have a, a political agenda with this. It's just that the shift of conversation globally from, um, and, and the shift of conversation within technology communities away from, um, from a lot of the, the basic presumptions and the basic conversation that we had been having in the past uh, moved, regardless of where on the political spectrum you are. Um, it, uh, it was, uh, 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 you know, Time, time to reevaluate. And so one of the things that was clear about what, uh, what conservancy and software freedom has to offer is the defense of our core technology. A lot of our member projects of conservancy are infrastructure projects like Git, you know, like they're things that people are using um, tools and, um, and other basic, uh, basic pieces of technology. And if we don't, if we don't safeguard that, if we don't make sure that if there are problems we can fix them, then um, we're, we're going to be in trouble in the long run. Um, I, uh, I kept thinking about the Volkswagen situation where Volkswagen um, was hiding its, uh, its the emissions um, information from its cars deliberately. Um, and I kept thinking about the engineers who were working there who knew that they were, is anybody here working at Volkswagen? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I see people laughing over there. So <laughs> we do have a Volkswagen employee or former employee in the audience. Um, and I thought about the, I thought about you. I thought about the engineers who, or the techn technological, like technologists who were working there who may have known that this was happening and couldn't, couldn't, um, you know, raise it, like raise the attention level and how terrible that must have felt, you know? And, and how well-meaning that we as technologists are um, generally, or how we assume that, or how we hope that our technology will be used for good. Now, I, uh, uh, this is a, a statue of an iron ring, because I had forgotten all about this. But the very guy who, who I spoke to, the very man who ran the computer center at the Cooper Union, who started me off 
entirely on uh, seriously on, uh, on on programming and on um, computers, computing in general. Um, he had been had, had been familiar with this thing called the order of the engineer. Raise your hand if you know what the order of the engineer is. Nobody. Okay. It's a Canadian-focused thing, so it's not that surprising. But I thought someone would have heard of it. Um, it is a um, it is a like a an ethical society of engineers. And so when I was in college, and it's the, it's a very big deal in Canada, but only a few universities in the United States and in Europe um, subscribe to it um, or, or 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 have 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 brought it over to them. And so uh, you can tell that someone's in the order of the engineer because you uh, they have an iron ring. Um, on the uh, on their uh, the pinky finger of their working hand, and so if you see someone with a with a very simple ring on their pinky finger, you know that they're probably in the order of the engineer. And the order of the engineer that the metal that the rings were originally made from were from a bridge in Canada that had um, that had uh, collapsed, and it was a reminder that the technology that we work on as engineers, and I was in engineering school. Um, can fail, and that we should always remember that we have a responsibility to society because the choices we make as engineers and as technologists have far-flung application. They have, uh, they could, they could impact a lot of people. So this is the, um, uh, this is the the oath I took that I, and I totally forgot all about it. I did it when I was, you know, 20, 21, and I never thought about it again until. I started thinking about these issues for, for, for Berlin buzzwords, actually. Um, and I suddenly remembered that I took an oath that actually I had pledged to practice integrity, fair dealing, tolerance, and respect, and uh, that my skill carries with it an obligation to serve humanity. And it's so interesting. It recognizes the idea that we, as engineers and technologists, have special knowledge. We have superpowers. And we have to use those superpowers for good, because we have information that other people don't. And if we are not cognizant of the ways in which our technology can fail, we're going to be in trouble. Now, this is a huge deal in Canada, um, which is really cool, because uh, everybody who goes to engineering school gets sworn into the order of the engineer. And the night before um, uh, they do that, it's like prank night, because it's the very last time that you can ethically do a prank, because otherwise, once you're join in the, join the order of the engineer, you've sworn not to. And so this is um, like a bunch of engineering schools in, um, quite a few of them in, um, in Canada have sculptures of the, iron, of the ring and the order of the engineer. And this is one where they took that statue as part of the prank and made it an Occupy Mortar statue, because uh, there should be one ring to why not rule them all. Um, is what the, the small slide says, um, and it's so like you know uh, if you're if you hear of like a lot of uh, of pranks that sometimes engineering people do where they put cows on the roofs and things like that. Sometimes they're before the swearing in of the order of the engineer because after that you can't conduct pranks because you are sworn to behave ethically. And so I was thinking about this and how this influenced my um, my thoughts about free and open source software. And I thought that um, that the very idea of tying in the responsibility of engineers and technologists to technology is not something that I have heard in any other context. And with the world that we're um, with the, the world that we're in right now, technology is underlying everything. Technology is you know software. It touches everything that we do. It touches the way we communicate with people. It touches the way we create anything. It touches our uh, the way that we um, you know the way that we create anything um, and the way we solve problems. And we are entrusting most of that technology to single companies that may or may not have our interests at heart. Um, an example of this is that um, my, um, my defibrillator shocked me twice when I was pregnant. Um, my heart was doing what normal pregnant women's heart, hearts do. About uh, more than 25% of women who are pregnant um, have uh, palpitations, and my heart was palpitating in a way that it would normally do for some pregnant women. Um, but because I had a defibrillator, I got shocked twice. And now I promise you that I had a Medtronic device at the time. I promise you that Medtronic did not want pregnant patients to get shocked. Literally, the last thing that Medtronic would want would be for pregnant women to get shocked. Um, but nonetheless, 
I wasn't a use case that they were attuned to, only 4%, or less than 4% of pacemaker defibrillators go to patients younger than 65. So the number of, and there are many more men with these devices than women for a variety of reasons. That could be a whole other talk. Um, but uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the chances, the, sat, the sample set of pregnant women who have defibrillators is quite small. So it's just not a use case that they were focused on, and I can't, I can't blame them for it. But I had no access to the, um, the software in my body. I couldn't ask Medtronic. I, I asked Medtronic for the source code, but they wouldn't give it to me, nor would any of the other major manufacturers. Um, and I couldn't even look at it to see if I could you know, submit a patch for my own situation. Um, and so the way that we solved it was by giving me medication to slow my heart rate down so that, um, so that I, I wouldn't be shocked. Not because my heart rate needed to be slowed down, I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs. It was uh, so in intense, but only to prevent my device from giving me unnecessary treatment. And this stood for the proposition that we might not, the companies that are entrusted with these roles may be very well-intentioned. They may have the best intentions. They may be the most ethically run company ever. There might be plenty of executives who would walk out if the company did anything the slightest bit untoward, but they can't anticipate every situation. And so we can't rely on single companies in order to, uh, to protect ourselves. This is just a picture of a, a cat protecting a fish store. Sort of like, you know, who do we want in charge of our technology? Probably people whose incentives are aligned with the public's. And where these lines are are, are, are tough. Um, Transparency is a huge part of free and open source software, and one of the main things that I argue for when it comes to my own medical condition, but all software that we rely on. Um, we need to make sure that we have the ability to, um, to take a look at our software and find out what's going on with it, um, and to determine if we're being surveilled, um, you know, run, run tests, uh, make it open to scrutiny, but most importantly, um, having the source code in the event of catastrophic failure and being able to fix those problems when they arise. Looking at the, um, looking at the, uh, the state of global politics, um, and particularly in my own country, I can say that, um, uh, that after the US election, I got my first uh, personally targeted uh, hate tweet um, uh, which was uh, interesting. Most of my threats previously had been, uh, had been either uh, in, uh, in comments or in private email, not publicly. <laughs> um, and, so, uh, and so what, I, what, what I've seen is, and what, uh, what a lot of articles have been written is that there, uh, there's uh, a little bit more hate that's visible in our society, and uh, making sure that we have inclusive communities um, is really important, and that's one thing that um, that Conservancy is working on through our outreach and internship program. But it's one thing that is should be totally fundamental to software freedom, right? Something that should be a part of free and open source software should be the the access that it gives to everyone. When we have software freedom, we make the source code available; anyone can see it. And so, uh, you know, I, I I think once people have access to their um, to their technology. Um, it's, a, it's empowering and democratizing, and it means that, uh, that anyone can pick it up and run with it. They can translate it to their own languages. They can, uh, they can, they can do what they want with it. And so even though we're, we're failing a little bit in terms of um, making sure our communities are, are diverse, and, um, and we can see that just when we look around at almost any of our conferences, they look uh, pretty homogeneous. Um, the fundamental ideas behind software freedom are ones that are about inclusiveness and, um, and about making sure that, um, that anyone can have access to their technology and make a difference with it. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's really important. And I think the, the main thing is, is that uh, what I, I really I have to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, it was really touch and go for me for a long time. <laughs> Am I devoting my life to the right cause? Am I wasting my time? I mean, I'm working for a nonprofit and struggling, right? It's so hard to make a charity go, you know? I, I mean, I'm, raise your hand if you give, if you donate to a charity somewhere, um, any of them. So that's like, uh, like 
half of the audience. Raise your hand if you donate to more than two. So that's only, that's good work. That's a lot of people. It's like an eighth of the audience, um, much more than I expected it to be. But, uh, but most of us pick a charity at most and donate to that. And we don't, um, you know, it, and it, it, so, so running a charity that is maybe not the biggest name on the, on the block for a cause that is less immediate is sort of like, you know, it's such hard work. It's such a struggle. We run, uh, Conservancy has four people. And, uh, and we run uh, the nonprofit for over 40 free software projects. We do GPL enforcement. We have a tremendous amount of bookkeeping and administrative work. And we're also, we have no marketers on staff. We're the ones who have to explain why this is important. Um, we're the ones doing the blog posts. We're the run I'm, I'm the one packing t-shirts when we have people sign up as supporters. So if anyone here is waiting for their t-shirt, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but uh, but it's, so, it's so much hard work. And I'm a, I'm a lawyer and an engineer. And making an, a nonprofit salary and working all the time on this cause, is it the right thing to do? Does it make sense? And for a little while there, I really wasn't so sure. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, in working through it and thinking about it over the last, uh, the, 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 the last six months or so, I've, I've realized that, um, that this is a long-term issue, right? The, the state of our basic infrastructure is is critical, and it's not necessarily something that's going to formulate today. But today, we're making choices that will affect us for a very long time. Today, we're building products in corporations and together, generally, where, uh, where we're relying on commercial closed proprietary software for fundamental things. And that's going to come bite us. And I, I think it, it, looking at the studies, it, it seems pretty, pretty clear that we're going to have some major disasters. We'd have major disasters if all the software were free and open source, but at least when those disasters happened, we'd have something to do about it, right? With, uh, with proprietary software, we're just relying on a company to first admit there's a problem and then do something about it. We're relying on them to be able to get enough money through, uh, through their business model, through financing, through VC, through whatever means that they have to make sure that they care about our situation. And they may not even be attuned to it, like in the case of my defibrillator. And we can't simply be scrambling when things go wrong. We have to make good, sound infrastructure decisions now. And so last night I was talking to Christian, and, uh, and he said, with big data comes big responsibility. And I think that's 100% right, especially in data where, you know, there are a lot of issues. I'm not saying that free and open source software is the only issue. We could talk a long time about open data. We could talk about a whole variety of ethical issues around it. But making sure that our software is free and open source is a cornerstone. It's an essential first step. And what we know from free and open source software, and this is the thing that, um, that has pulled me around entirely, is that the entire ethos of it being free and open source software is that we acknowledge that we haven't quite gotten it right yet, that we know we can always improve what we're doing, and that we know that our basic suppositions and assumptions can always be questioned. And that is the fundamental idea what it is to participate in a free and open source software community. And we should apply that to everything because we can't take fundamental things for granted. We know that we won't be perfect. We know that we can always improve. And for me, that's quite personal. But it should be for you, too. Because about 3 million people in the world have, have uh, pacemakers. That's not even including insulin pumps or all the other implanted devices. And every year, 600,000 are implanted. So if we're all lucky enough, we'll all become cyborgs. We don't even know what kind of technology that's going to be and how it will interface with everything else that we're using. We won't know what the critical infrastructure is for our own bodies and for the fundamental things of our society. And so I encourage you to uh, think about using free and open source software for all of your fundamental choices um, because it is about the future that we're going to build. And so uh, Conservancy is a charity. Um, I, I, I don't want to be so shilly as to say, if you donate to a charity, it should be Conservancy. <laughs> but, uh, but think about um, if you have any disposable income, think about donating to some of the charities in our space. We're working on the issues that are going to be really a big deal in 10, 20 years. And so we need people with the technical knowledge 
and the responsibility and the foresight to help these initiatives get going so that we know that we're looking after our future. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Okay. So we have some time for questions. You can ask about anything. You can ask, oh, there's one up there. Ah, do I update the firmware on my defibrillator? Yeah, if I wanted to patch it. So right now, the, um, the way that the, um, the, these defibrillators work is almost all of them have a wireless component, and you get them. The terminology in this field is so hilarious. So um, when you have a device, the medical companies have their, like, uh, have their computers that they use to interface with the devices. Um, and those are called programmers. Um, and they interrogate the device. I feel like I would have picked a different term, but okay. So they interrogate it. So, uh, so uh, I was lucky enough to get my first defibrillator. It was an old device, um, and uh, and I found a. I finally found an electrophysiologist who got what I was talking about, and he uh, he found one of the last sterile defibrillators that had no um, had didn't have the radio telemetry in it, and so. The device that I had before, you could only talk to with magnetic, um, uh, you know, with a uh, magnetic coupling, and so uh, and so my device had been updated many times using the um, using the so-called programmer. Uh, but in order for someone to use that, they have to be right on your chest, like it's right, it has to be right next to the device. Um, and I recently, less than three weeks ago, got a new device, so I'm a little. A little still recovering from it, <laughs> but uh, but and this is the only device available in the United States that can have the uh, radio telemetry switched off. There was only one device I could find, so uh, I want the ability to patch my device, but I want to be able to control who accesses my device. Right now, these devices have no real security on them, not even password protection on them, um, and they are broadcasting the. Um, programmers are designed to interact with them wirelessly. Um, from when I go to the um, the electrophysiologist, um, they they tell me that um, that they can still see the defibrillators of the people who have been in their offices. They can still see them um, until they're completely out of the building. So you can um, and uh, and there have been researchers who white hat hackers who have shown that you can. Um, t Control a, a take you know exploit a defibrillator and deliver a, a fatal shock or and then insulin pump a lethal dose um, uh, using an iPhone in a public place. Um, so I want the ability to update my software. I want the ability to patch it, but I also want to be able to control who accesses this technology. Right? I want real security. I want real security and free and open source software. I don't want not just anyone to be able to patch my device. I want to be able to hire medical professionals. I want to be able to organize all of the pregnant women with defibrillators to get together to fund the you know, uh, uh, development on a patch so that all of the pregnant women that have palpitating hearts don't get shocked in the future, right? And I don't, I don't know how, I don't have access to the source code, so I can't determine that for myself right now, but uh, whether that's even feasible, but I would like to be able to know. And right now, that's simply not the case. So there are, it's funny because I think people are often put off by my argument because they're saying, you're, you know, you're, 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 you've lost all perspective if you think that, uh, that, that we should be giving pa patients access to their devices. And I'm saying I want access to the source code, but I want real encryption, real security on my device. Hi. Uh, as compared to open source uh, software, uh, do you see a, a benefit or uh, where do you see free software um, is there a difference, uh, or do you prefer one of them uh, over the other? Oh, free software versus open source software? Sure. I think as long as we're talking about freedom, I don't mind so much. I have to admit to you that, um, so when I was new to the field, I got uh, taken in quickly by people who insisted that we needed to say free software and never open source software because we were somehow, uh, I'm going to say taken in, but I was convinced really fast that, um, the, that I needed to only say free software if I wanted to signal to people that I cared about freedom. Um, and then over the years, I felt like more people knew the term open source, and I felt like I was losing people by just saying free software. And so then I became quite adamant, 
And I don't think I'm overstepping here to say that I argued with Richard Salman many times over, uh, over when I would say free and open source software. Um, and he would say, just use free software. And, uh, and, and I would explain why I felt like that was inadequate. Um, and, uh, and then, now, like then over the course of the years, I realized that I was kind of, I was kind of suckered by the, uh, <laughs> by the, the, the business friendly open source enthusiasts who made a lot of the freedom advocates feel like talking about freedom at all was alienating to business. And what difference did it make how we referred to it? And so, uh, so for a little while there, I was contemplating using only the term open source because that's what people talk about. And people, you know, the word open source, words open source had won, but if you said open source, you knew that you would have the right to modify and distribute those modifications, right? It, like there's, there, it wouldn't really be open source if you, if it was just, you know, both terms free and open are inadequate, right? Free makes it sound like it's free as in price, and uh, and open just makes it sound like you can look at it, but it doesn't mean that you can do anything with it when you see it. So, uh, but now I have to say that. So then I sort of started feeling like, you know, actually I'd been a little bit tricked because it was true that we had um, we had accommodated the commercial sale of free and open source software such that a lot of developers felt for a while like they couldn't even suggest copyleft as a license without being laughed out of the room. But a lot of things had changed. Um, uh, HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, uh, uh, like a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, had an announcement like a, that, that the uh, GPLv3 was their preferred license and Martin Fink, their um, CTO, got up on stage and talked about why the GPL was so much better for business and how we'll be paying for the same permissive infrastructure over and over again. All the same governance around permissively licensed or lax license or dismissively licensed, depending on how you want to call it, um, licenses if, if we don't start going back to copy left a little bit. So I think as long as we're talking about the same thing, I don't mind it so much. But I would say that, um, that free and open source software is, uh, is something where we have to keep the ideology close. No matter how we talk about it, we have to think about these society, um, societal implications. The balance of power that we have with free and open source software is delicate. And especially in the areas that all of you are active in, um, that would bring you here, um, companies have gone away from copy left. And, um, and uh, that means that it's a lot harder to keep control, keep, keep your software um, fully in the public and make sure that we can protect against some of the, you know, copy left is just one strategy um, for, for dealing with this. It's, uh, I don't care what license my software is under if, as long as I have, you know, as long as I have the freedoms connected to it. Um, and licensing is just one way to accomplish that. There are other ways. Um, but, uh, but copy left did keep the balance of power. Um, uh, and Martin Fink described it as like, uh, swinging the pendulum back in the other direction. And I think we've seen, we've seen some of that. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Do you get access to the data that comes off your defibrillator? And do you know who else gets it? Oh my gosh, so this is a huge issue. The, and, and what's funny is, so I started speaking about this, and then there was a, um, uh, I knew about, learned about a man who was just a few years older than me, who had the very same condition as me. And, uh, and we found out about each other because I was, um, I was interviewed by NPR the same week that he gave a TED talk, and people were like, and we both had the same hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as our disease, <laughs> and we both have defibrillators, and we're, we were talking about two sides of the same coin. So his name is Hugo Campos, and he's working on getting access to all of his data, um, and this is incredibly important and, um, and something that's really, really difficult to do. Um, so the device manufacturers, um, do collect a lot of data um, uh, about it, and I, I worry a lot about it. When I recently got my defibrillator out, I, um, I requested to keep it. I should have brought it, actually, because now I have, like, I can hold it up and be like, this thing was in my body. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, I also was able to get the data file off of it. Um, so I'm curious to see what I can, what I can find from that. Um, but uh, but the, the, the it's very hard to know, to answer the second part of your question, who is getting access to the data? Because theoretically, it's simply the medical device manufacturer in your doctor's office. Um, and there are strict laws um, in most countries that I'm aware of uh, for handling that. Um, but there was a recent study that was published where uh, researchers were able to buy the programmers in the um, aftermarket off of eBay. And uh, one of the devices had 
like thousands of patients' data, like patients' worth of data on it, had like their condition and their doctor's name and their like all of their their history um, and information from their devices. And there aren't procedures in hospitals for uh, for dealing with wiping these devices before they get rid of them. And so I uh, I think that the controlling this data so that it's only um, held by the people who should have it, while at the same time giving rights to patients, is uh, a huge problem. There's a new uh, Really, there's like a whole movement around patient empowerment, and uh, uh, I've really been happy to uh, to get a part to, to become a part of that because as these devices become cheaper and more people have them, um, more technologically savvy people have access to them, and then we can we can really get access to them. This is especially relevant in the insulin pump space. There's like a, the Night Scout Foundation or the We're Not Waiting movement where people have reverse engineered their insulin pumps so they can more precisely deliver their own insulin, so they make themselves artic artificial pancreases. Um, and having access to your own data is totally critical to this, and, um, and it's a really important piece of the puzzle. I can't see if we're out of, there's someone who has a question down here, I don't know if we're out of time. We're totally out of time. I'll be around all day, so feel free to find me. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your conference, and thank the organizers if you see them, maybe even give them a high five. Thanks. <laughs>